Right, so um, first half we looked at uh, evolution, how that's important to psychology. Now we're going to have an introduction to, uh, to, if I can even say it, that's the hardest part, to genetics and its role in psychology. Um, we start off, uh, like we did with evolution, talk about well, why I think it's important to have an understanding of genetics in psychology and the role it can have. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very brief, brief introduction to genetics uh, in terms of uh, Mendelian genetics, it's really our, uh, the origins of our understanding about how genes work, and a bit about molecular genetics, which might be quite useful. And they're going to talk about things that are going to be relevant to us, particularly in terms of understanding uh, the role of genetics in our evolution uh, and our evolution of our psychology. So things like mutations um, and our, our own genetics. So look at uh, the human genome and what, what that taught us about, about humans. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to finish off with um, introducing or discussing with you the search for genes for behaviour, uh, about how that's going about and about how that as well as taught us a lot about um, the role of genetics and how that has changed um, over the course of, 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 course of the years. <coughs> so why, why is it important to study genetics? Why is it uh, useful to do so? Um, well, your brain is a biological organ. It is the result of biology. There it is. It's squishy and it's made, it's a physical thing, and that's where all your behavior comes from, all your psychology comes from. And like all organs, so like your liver, or sorry, your kidneys there, or your lungs, the, that's sheep's lungs, not your lungs. Um, they're all built by genes. So we'd understand how our kidneys work, and how our lungs work, and how our livers work from an evolutionary perspective, from a genetic perspective, from a biological perspective. Why don't we do it for our brain? This is where there's a lot of resistance, having a biological genetic understanding of psychology. But we shouldn't do. Most of the time in psychology, we're looking at behavior. We're looking at, at things that you can actually observe the humans doing, the psychological uh, phenomena that we see around us, be it how we behave, how we think, how we fill in a questionnaire or a survey. But let's look at the origin of those behaviors. Where do those behaviors come from? And they come from the brain. And we can study the brain, but what we're interested in here is about, well, what makes that brain? What makes that brain is genes. Different genes control for how your brain grows, how it develops, and what makes up the different parts of it. And those different genes have been selected for. Those genes that made the best brains in terms of helping you survive were more likely to go on to future generations. So we need to understand the genetics of this. So from there, we can get the genetics of our own psychology, of our behavior. Once we've got that, we can answer some really important questions or start to understand them or at least start to understand how we don't know the answer to them from understanding the genetic basis. We look at the nature versus nurture question. Are things inbuilt? Are they innate? Are they genetic in origin? Or are they shaped by the environment or society? Well, the short answer to that is it's, it's always both. But if you understand the genetics behind it, it gives you a better understanding of that part of it, the nature part of it. Uh, and for me, psychology is not a social science. It's not um, akin to lots of other areas in humanities, which a lot of psychologists think it is. It is a social subject. For me, it's a branch of biology. Simple as that. We're looking at the actions of one particular organ, the brain. Um, so it's rooted, for me, in biology. Now, a lot of other people who will teach you on the course will disagree with that completely. But for me, understanding that will help shape our understanding of everything we need to know uh, in other areas of the course. And the part of that, key part of that, is an understanding of genetics um, as part of this. Now, an, an understanding, not a full understanding. And I'll talk a bit more about the difference there and why you'll be probably relieved to know you don't have to know everything about genetics later on. Why we're talking about this when we talk about evolution is evolution and genetics are very, very closely intertwined, interconnected, and they, and they should be. It was a big part of Darwin's theory of natural selection. He had the idea um, that what happened is traits that will help you survive, that made you outcompete others, will be passed on to future generations. The problem is, is they had no idea how those traits were inherited, how they were passed on to future generations. He came up with this idea called blending, where what happens is uh, 
Uh, the characteristics of both parents are blended together uh, and that's what you inherit. And we know now that that's not true. If you look at something like eye colour, you know, we all have very distinct eye colours. We only inherit one particular eye colour. It's that if it was always blending, we'd always be sort of this lightish brown coloured eyes, but we don't. So it doesn't work. Um, and he did, never did really fully understand how traits were inherited. It was, it was an issue. We knew that they were inherited. We knew that offspring looked quite a lot like their parents. So we knew that these traits were inherited. We just didn't know how. And then we got the work of Gregor Mendel. Not long after Darwin, so he published his work on um, genetic inheritance in 1866. Darwin published Origin of Species in 1859, so it was just seven years afterwards. Now Mendel, with his work on pea plants, which you may remember from GCSE Biology, he was the first one to really understand the basis of inheritance. He understood this idea of genes. And since then, since his work, since Darwin's work on evolution and Mendel's works on genetics, we've got what's called a modern synthesis of understanding all life on this planet, which is a combination of evolution and genetics. And it started off with these two. In the first half, we talked a bit about Darwin. We're going to talk now about Mendel and his work on pea plants. What, um, what Mendel did, very simple experiments with different pea plants. And he cross-fertilised them, different strains of them with different characteristics, and he wanted to see what happened in future generations. What he was interested in is the colour of the pods. And they could vary uh, a lot in what colour they could be. And two colours he was interested in were uh, plants that had yellow pods and plants that had green pods. What happens if you uh, get a green plant and a yellow plant um, to have offspring together? Now, if Darwin was right, and it was this idea of blending of the colours, so they sort of mixed together, now what you should expect is when you have yellow and green, you should have this really sort of light yellowy green in all offspring. This is what Mendel was testing. He found that this wasn't the case. He found if you put together a yellow and a green uh, coloured pod plants, we get very strange frequencies on different populations. It wasn't 50-50. What he found is that in the next generation, all the plants were yellow. They had yellow pods. So they only inherited yellow pod colour from one parent, nothing about green um, pod colour. But in the next generation, he then found that a quarter of them would be green. So it's very strange frequencies, from, and he found this quite consistently. You know, he did lots and lots of experiments, lots and lots of observations, and he found this quite consistently. So from that, he worked out something about how those different traits were inherited. What he worked out is that each, um, each of these plants had a particular, a particular, what he called a particle of heredity, which we now know would be genes. He knew that each plant has a, a particle of inheritance, and they get those from each parent. So they've got, each of them got two. And from it he worked out in this basics that there were two types. It could either be a, a particle that would cause the, the pods to be green or a particle that caused the pods to be yellow. But because he found such strange frequencies in future generations, we worked out, well, one of them must be much more likely to occur than the other. In this case, it would be yellow. So we worked out from this that the yellow one must be dominant over the green one. And the green one is recessive. So in other words, if, if a plant has the yellow particle or the yellow gene, then it will always be yellow because that's dominant. And that's what he worked out. So he worked out that originally two plants, one parent had two yellow particles and the other parent had two green particles. And each of those went into the next generation so that every uh, plant inherited one yellow particle from one parent and one green particle from the other parent. Now, because yellow is dominant over green, all these plants were always yellow. But if you cross uh, uh, two yellow plants that have what are called heterozygous, they have a yellow particle and a green particle, well eventually you find that the two green particles will go together and because they're recessive and there's no dominant yellow allele being present, then green will be expressed. So you only get green when two recessive, allele, uh, two recessive particles are together. This is why, how he worked out very cleverly, 
how genes worked, this idea of dominant and recessive genes. So if you have both copies of the yellow gene, you're yellow. If you have one copy of the yellow gene and the green gene, you're going to be yellow because yellow is dominant over green. The only way green could be expressed is if the individual had both greens. So from that, um, very simple way of understanding it, this idea of Mendelian genetics, we get a real basic idea about how genes work and how they're expressed. But that was only really the start of it. Mendel's work was really important, but he didn't actually understand anything about where genes were, how they worked, what they did, you know, what they were made of. It was only since then that we know a lot more about how genetics actually work, what's called molecular genetics, and really getting down to nitty-gritty about how it works. Now we know that all of our genes are assembled in the nucleus of all of our cells, and they're arranging chromosomes. So this is a, a, an x-ray of one of them. And you can see each of those little blue bits there, they're just strands of genetics. And they form this sort of a, a chromosomal shape, normally a sort of an X shape. And that's where they're all collected. And they're passed on, so we know that we get the genes from our, our parents, our mothers and fathers. We get one from each one. So each of the chromosomes, we get one from our parent, one from our mother, one from our father. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So all of our genes, all of our genetics, is put onto 23 different chromosomes. And that's, there they're all there. So you know, they sort of all look quite similar. Other species have different numbers of them. Some of them have a lot more pairs of chromosomes, some have a lot less. Doesn't mean that they're more advanced than us, it just so happens we have 23 pairs. And the 23rd chromosome is where uh, chromosomal sex is, um, is determined. So normally individuals who have uh, an X and a Y chromosome, so they've inherited the X from the mother uh, and a Y from the father, they'll be male. Chromosomal, uh, chromosomal sex will be male. If they've got the X from a uh, their mother and an X from their father, then they'll be female. So that's where it actually occurs. This chromosomal sex is determined there in our chromosomes. But what are chromosomes made of? What, is actually what are genes made of? This is where we know about deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA. Uh, we've got Crick and Watson here. Uh, Francis Crick and John Watson, looking very pleased with themselves. Well, they won a Nobel Prize. I bet they're pleased with themselves. They discovered the structure of genetics, structure of DNA. They knew it formed what's called this double helix, this sort of twisty pattern. They found that DNA in our chromosomes is made up of two strands, two strands of DNA that are wound together. Uh, and those two, those two strands are bonded together. And each of those strands is made up of a sequence of what's called base pairs, which is just uh, sections of, of DNA. And there's four different groups, uh, four different base pairs, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And they bond together. When the two, the two strands bond together, it's only specific base pairs that bond together. So an A will bond with a T, and a G will bond with a C. So you've got this very long strand two very long strands of DNA made up of all these different base pairs. And we know that when there's an A on one side, there's a T on the other, G on one side, C on the other. And that's how they're bonded together. So you can see the, you know, the little bonds between them there. And it takes about 27,000 base pairs to make up a single gene, roughly speaking. And what these base pairs do is a sequence of them in a particular order will make what's called an amino acid. They've got a particular code on. A section of three different base pairs will be the recipe for bringing a one together, one amino acid. And it brings all these amino acids together, which then form a protein, which then go and form your, your skin, your, your, uh, your brains, anything. Your liver, lungs, all these different things physiologically are made, and the recipe is in the DNA. <coughs> and the way it works is a replicator is they've got these very long strands of DNA. They're very tight, they're very strongly bonded together. They can't break. But the bonds between the base pairs here are quite weak. There's what's called hydrogen bonds. Those of you who do A-level chemistry will remember hydrogen bonds all comes <gasps> frightening back to you. Think, oh, so I had to forget about that. Well, you probably do. But they're very weak bonds, so the two strands can easily be unzipped. Once they're unzipped, 
you've got two strands of DNA. On each one is a perfect recipe for making the other one. Because if you know that there's an A there, there must be a T on the other side, the C must be a G, and so on. So once it splits, it forms two molecules. And then what can happen is it can bond together with new strands and create two new strands. So one strand can split, one, one helix can split, and, and bond together with new ones and form two new molecules. That is replication. Don't worry too much about the specifics of it, because I don't really understand it either. Enough. All you need to know is once DNA as an actual molecule, as a chemical, as a chemical structure, we, when it could first start to replicate, in other words, we knew that they could form different elements and bond together with new ones to create new things, we've got replication. We've got replication on the planet. Once things can replicate, things can grow, things can develop, things can evolve. So this was the key origin of life, was the fact that this very strange uh, chemical we had in our systems could replicate. And everything followed from that. But it is complicated. It is complicated. How do we know, uh, well, what creates these different structures? So we've got the DNA, the strands, and like I say, the base pairs, each three base pairs forms a particular amino acid. And those three base pairs are called codons. And there's 20 different types. Um, some of them are quite common. So you get a glutamic acid. So that's the codon for, for bringing together an amino acid called glutamic acid. And that's formed when you've got a G, an A, and an A together. And what happens is there's a long recipe there on the, on the strand of DNA. And what together, it will take a little snippet, it will be one gene, and bring it together, all these different amino acids, there's the recipe, and they'll form together to form a protein that will be used to create some structure in your body. And then at the end it will say stop. And like I say, there's 20 different ones, lots of different versions, 20 different ones, so 27,000 base pairs make it. You know, there's a huge, you know, almost uh, infinite number of combinations of amino acids you can have. Um, and you can see the different ones. Disappointingly, cat never came up. My wife works as a geneticist, and she actually, she'll sit in front of a computer with a, like a long strand of, of DNA. Well, not, not physically stuck on the string. You know, there's computer systems where you can just download the entire genome of something. And she'll look through it and like go, and she doesn't get excited when she sees the word cat. I would, but then, you know, I don't really use it that much. But yeah, all the different ones there. And they bond together to form different genes. Now, do not worry if none of that made sense. Or that was just like, went way over your head and think, I don't even grasp any of that. How do proteins make? What do you mean they unzipped and they form a new ones? Well, where does it go then? How much you have to know as a psychologist about genetics is probably quite low compared to the everything you could know about genetics. That's probably increasing though, and I'll talk a bit more about why that is. I think we need to know more about genetics. But the take home message here is it's complicated and it doesn't always seem logical. But then life on the planet was never designed to be perfectly, work perfectly well. And DNA is a good example of something that doesn't work particularly well. And you'll see more of that later on. But having a grasp of it, thinking about things about genetics, having appreciation of it is, I think, quite important. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you this question. How many genes make up a single human? I'll give you a clue, it's above 100, that's all I'm going to say. How many genes? We'll have another. So again, it's a poll everywhere. <coughs> have a think. Based on whatever you think it might be, what do you think, how many genes do you think make up a human? This is um, it's a good question to ask because it was something that, um, I'll talk a bit about it in a minute, it was something that's very key to understanding human, well, human psychology from a genetic perspective. We think about ourselves as incredibly complex. And you think as, yep, the first few people are thinking actually, well, someone's got a question. Um, it must be a lot. We're so complicated. It must be a lot of genes. But how many genes is a lot of genes? And we've got quite a wide distribution here already. 
to the pit. Oh. 800, that's very bold. So we've got a nice wide mix between 800 and the billions. Billions, sorry, so more than one billion. Um, most of you seem to be doing quite well on this. The answer is probably about 25,000. So well done, those people who got it. That was a guess, fantastic. We could have done with your thinking about 20 years ago. Why it's interesting, why I want to talk about it is because it's uh, something we don't just guess anymore. We now know more about that. It's something called the Human Genome Project. Um, this is back in 2001. Uh, I've got Craig Venter here, uh, who works, uh, he had a, set up a big lab, a big commercial project to map the human genome. In other words, map the entire sequence of A, C's, G's and T's. Um, and it was a huge project around the, around the turn of the millennium. There were a number of different groups working on it. They were the first to do it and they published it in 2001. It was his genome that was published. Uh, and this was, you know, it was amazing. I remember it at the time, it was just, it just incredible that we actually could get the full sequence of a human's DNA. Uh, nowadays, you can get it easily for less than $1,000. There's, uh, there's particular projects set up to try and get you to be able to get your own genome sequence for under $100. Which if you really want to know what it is, you'll get it and you'll look at it and think, oh wow, I'll get to find out the sequence about what it is to be me. You won't, you'll just get a series of A, C's, G's and T's. And all they'll tell you is that, you, you know, you're probably going to get heart disease when you're 80. Oh, thank you very much. They're not going to say, you're a wonderfully entertaining person. All these secret skills you didn't know you had. No, it's probably just going to say, don't smoke, smoking will kill you. Be like, I knew that already. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, and, you know, people are interested in it. And when, when it was done, it turned out that it was, well, 3.2 billion base pairs. So 3.2 billion ACs, Gs and Ts in a particular sequence over this 23 chromosomes, making up about 25,000 genes, which is a lot less than people were expecting. And I'll come back to that. Because what's even more important, and coming back to my point about DNA being incredibly strange to try to understand, I think, in terms of looking at it as in this perfectly wonderful thing that we have that helps us replicate, is that a lot of our... DNA, a lot of our genome, is junk. It's stuff that doesn't do anything. It's base pairs that aren't genes. It's just there. Even less of it actually codes for particular proteins. A lot of it is things that say things to stop or some things get transcribed, but maybe they don't actually translate into actual genes. Uh, then we've got other things like pseudogenes, genes that once created something but don't do it anymore, so it's still there in our DNA, but it just hasn't got rid of. Um, this is transposable elements. Parts of bases, uh, so sequences of your, gene, uh, your genome that just jumps around, that just replicates for no reason and jumps around to different places. Uh, there's lots of different ones. The famous one is uh, one called ALU. It's a sequence of base pairs, about 300 bases, but you've got about a million copies of them just because it's copied and just copies into all different chromosomes. Uh, then you get some things where you've got long sequences that are just repeated for no reason. So you, know, you get CCG, but it's repeating, you know, like your cat sending on your keyboard sort of thing. That's what a lot of your DNA is, just things replicating. So there's lots of just junk there that doesn't do anything. Why is it still there? Why isn't it, you know, why isn't it disappeared? Why is, you've got all these 3.2 billion bases when most of it does nothing? Well, it could be that <coughs> it hasn't been selected against. Maybe it's just stuck there. It doesn't do you any harm, so keep it there. It's there in other species. So maybe it's just something that was really relevant in our evolutionary history, but still relevant now. Well, not relevant now. Then this other idea called evolvability. If you've got a lot of genes, uh, or the ability to make lots of genes if it comes about, then you're more likely to cope with any new problems that we might face. So say a particular disease epidemic comes around. If you've got particular DNA that could help with that, that hasn't done anything for millions of years, that would be very useful. We don't know. We're learning more now. But the answer um, is that, well, we don't really understand what the difference is between junk DNA and not junk DNA, proper DNA. But again, that sort of changed how we think about genetics. And that came about really from the human genome. The human genome 
didn't answer really any questions. It just changed what the questions were and how we thought about it. And one of the things was about how many genes make up a human. And you know, a lot of you were very right. We're saying 20,000, 25,000. But I remember at the time, people think, well, 100,000 genes, surely, based on the ideas that you know, our brain is so complex. And when it came out, um, and now we know more about the size of other genomes of other species, well, we're really not unique at all. So here's some other ones. So we've got, uh, we've got fruit flies at the top. They've got 13,000 genes. Uh, you've got C. elegans, this type of worm, 19,000 genes. Humans, 20 to 25,000. Rats, 21,000. So we've got about the same number of genes as rats. But where did, our, you know, where did all these unique human traits come? Where did our huge intelligence come from? If we've got the same number of genes as rats. And at the time, and still now, people say, ah, look, it shows you can't really understand human psychology, human nature from a genetic perspective because so few genes make up a human. It needs to be a lot more. Well, that sort of changed how we thought about it. So the idea was that more complex things means more genes. So you need more genes to make something. Isn't true. There's not a linear relationship between them. It's a lot more complex than that. So not necessarily the amount of genes you have. It's what those genes do. So <clears throat> as species get more complex, like humans are with our big brains, maybe you don't need more genes, uh, genes to make more brains. You need more other things. Maybe things like non-coding DNA. <clears throat> if there's a, you know, it could just be something simple as there is a sort bit of genes that said, make some brain, make some grey matter. And then in humans, there's just some coding that says, do it again, do it again, do it again. That goes to our big brains. You don't need more genes, you just need that gene to do it a number of times. Any of you who do computer programming know that it's, there's lots of more simpler ideas than putting more coding in. And maybe that's what all our non-coding DNA does, is causes us to increase those things much more. You don't need more genes. So maybe that's, that's sort of changed how we think about the relationship between genetics, uh, particularly with behavior. And this idea that every behavior has a gene or genes that make it up. Maybe it's not as straightforward as that, and it isn't. Other things that make it more confusing are, are mutations. So we, have, we all have um, some aspects of our genes that mutate. Okay? This goes back to the idea of variation that Darwin said was really important. We need to have lots of variations in traits, and we do, and that's what different variations are more successful, so certain types of height, certain levels of intelligence, certain fear of spiders are selected for. We can get new variation if you've got mutations in certain genes. And genes do mutate. They ha it happens very rarely, but we all have some mutation. We are all mutants. There are some of our genes that form mutations. It's caused by lots of different things. Um, natural x-rays, uh, the environment around us, being bitten by radioactive spiders, these sorts of things. Even our own genes cause our other genes to mutate. And it happens quite naturally. Most of the time, it does nothing. The effect of any mutation does, does you know, nothing. If it does do something, it's likely going to be a harmful effect. But sometimes when it does something, it causes something to work better. It actually improves how it functions. Um, Richard Dawkins gave the analogy of, of hitting a radio. Well, the, the hit, in the old days when televisions needed a good whack on the top to get them to work, not these days. But most of the time, you hit the top of a television, it does nothing. If you hit it, you know, eventually you'll hit it and it'll cause it to go even worse. Sometimes you'll whack the top of the television and it'll make it better. The picture will improve. The sound quality will improve. He said that's the same as mutation. Sometimes it causes something to work better. And all of a sudden, if you've got a mutation of a gene that causes that organism to be, be, uh, be better off, then it'll more likely to have offspring that will inherit that mutated gene and be more successful. And there's lots of different types of mutations. And again, this comes back to the fact that well, DNA does some very strange things. Uh, you can just have single bases. So one base will be wrong. It'll be a, a T instead of a C or a G instead of an A. Most of the time, that's fine. It'll still get exactly the same amino acid. Otherwise, you've got these transposable elements like alu, just copies and jumps around for, for no real reason. Are going to different places. Uh, you get some simple sequences repeat, like you know, the CCGs, like the cat standing on the keyboard sort of thing. That happens. That's mutation. Sometimes you get your whole genome that gets uh, mutated and replicated, which is very rare, but happens in some flowering plant. 
that's all I really want to talk about specific about genetics. Now, you're probably thinking that that is quite complicated. Hopefully you are thinking it's quite complicated, unless anyone's got a strong genetics background. Your psychology students, why do you need to learn about genetics? That's a good question. A limited understanding is probably okay. You can go into things in a lot more detail. My wife, like I said, my wife is a geneticist. I don't understand what she does. She talks to me about it and I just glaze over, just no idea. She said, I could come and give a talk to your students about you know, genetics. I think, be a bit wasted, really. It was just no offence to you, no offence to you. You shouldn't, you, know, you shouldn't really know anything about genetics. We don't ask it in our, um, in our uh, entry requirements. And it gets a lot more complicated than this. You know, I barely touch the surface of it. But we know, know a lot more about genetics. And I think being completely ignorant to genetics in understanding psychology isn't wise. You're going to open up so much about our understanding of the origins of things, about where they come from, about how they work by having an understanding of genetics. So just that start of it, and some of the other things that I'll talk about after this is important. But remember, it is complicated. That's a take-home message. If you are interested in more about this, please do read up more. Don't ask me. I'm pretty much at my limit. We could talk a bit more about it. But lots of really interesting uh, books, and there's one on the reading list about evolution genetics for psychology. But again, think about how much you need to know. From this, uh, we can start to understand other things, uh, more, uh, more common understandings about genetics, uh, particularly our own, our own psychology, in relation to what we understand about genetics. One thing that's quite common that we've known about for a long time with, in terms of uh, breeding of other species is problems with inbreeding. We now know why that's an issue. What tends to happen if you get two species, uh, sorry, two organisms that are quite closely related, be they sort of, you know, parent, offspring or, or siblings, if they reproduce and have offspring together, those offspring tend to be, uh, have a lot of problems. We now know why that is from having an understanding of genetics. What tends to happen is you've got, um, going back to what we talked about Mendel, with the idea of dominant and recessive genes. Quite often, things that are damaging are recessive. In other words, we often have recessive genes for some sort of some nasty conditions, but they're never expressed, because they very rarely occur, and they're always alongside a dominant gene. And so we're, we're unlikely to encounter someone else who has that recessive allele. So say the chance of having that allele, that recessive one, that recessive gene is one in a thousand, then the likelihood of finding someone else who also has that recessive gene is one in a thousand, so you know, the odds there are you know, a one in a million, and then only a quarter of your offspring would have that inherited disease. So you know, al already it's very, very unlikely that any individual will inherit that recessive gene and actually be expressed. The problem is, is if you have that recessive gene uh, and you breed with a close relative, they're much more likely to have that recessive gene than uh, a non-relative because they're related to you. So this is why we find inbreeding is a problem and it's something that um, farmers, plant growers have known for a long time. Now we know why that is from Mendel's work about recessive genes. But it works exactly the same in humans. And we find increasing relatedness means that it's much more likely to get these problems of inbreeding. So you find, you know, close relatives, say siblings um, having offspring, you know, does lead to these issues. So we know, and we know how this is a big effect on our psychology, but our understanding about inbreeding, understanding about these things, our thought, you know, our, our interpretations of it has been shaped by genetics. So there's a good example about how we now we know more about genetics gives us a better understanding of it. Other things to think about. Here's a nice easy one. Approximately how many genes do we share with a chimpanzee? And that's another question. Let me just activate it. There he is. There's a chimpanzee. How many genes, as a percentage, do you think we share with our close relatives? Good mix. I see now. Yeah, no, okay. <coughs> so 
Now, we all know quite a lot. A few of you getting it pretty much spot on. About 95 to 98% of our genes we share with chimpanzees. We're very closely related to chimpanzees. Okay, only 2% of our genes are different from that of um, uh, chimpanzees. So from that, we think quite rightly, well, we are very similar to them, and we are very similar to them. But what, have you ever thought about what that actually means? How, much, how similar is 98%? Well, in order to maybe get an understanding of that is, don't just think how many genes do we share with a chimpanzee. Let's look at what he's eating. How many genes do you share with a banana? So, you might want to use your, um, use your uh, chimpanzees as your benchmark and think about, well, what about bananas? Give you a clue, it's not as many as uh, chimpanzees, but then you think, well, how many of our genes do we actually share with them? Good answers coming through. <coughs> Bold, like it, wrong. It is about 50%. Well done, those. Very, very knowledgeable genetics people, it's good to see. Yeah, it's about 50%. So straight away you start thinking, well, okay, maybe we're not as similar to uh, chimpanzees as you know, that, that link isn't particularly special, seen as like half our genes we say with bananas. But then you think, okay, well, it's still 2% difference. That 2%'s got to explain a lot. It's got to explain the fact that we have bigger brains, we have language, we have theory of mind, we walk upright, we're less hairy, we're taller, all these sorts of things. And 2% is still quite a lot of genes. So it is quite relative. But we are, you know, we are all very closely related. Um, but, you know, sometimes people use it as an example. Oh, well, look at, look at chimpanzees. Why can't we be more like them? We're so similar. They still throw their poo around. You know, we don't, mostly. We're quite good at that. We've evolved past that. Yes, they're very intelligent, but there are still those differences. And that's, and that's an important thing. We now know this from, uh, from sequencing the, the chimpanzee genome and the banana genome. Having that understanding is really interesting. It changes how we think about things. Uh, and I want to finish off with, we're talking a bit about understanding genes for behavior, or more specifically, can we? Is that a reliable way of doing it? Well, firstly, one of the main issues with understanding behavior as being the result of genes in particular is that none of our behaviors are the result of a single gene. There's very few what's called single gene traits. Some things like eye colour are, although not entirely. Uh, blood type is determined by a single gene. Everything else is what's called polygenic. Lots of genes create it. So it's the same for everything about our physical set and when it comes to our psychology and our brains, lots of genes create it. So there's no single gene for intelligence. There'll be lots of different genes working in, in different ways. No gene for personality, no gene for height. So when people talk about or try to find genes for these things, they struggle for a very good reason, is they all work together in different ways to create eventually your intelligence or your height. Let's just take an example, theoretical example. Let's say um, there's six different types of genes for height, A, B, C, D, and F, E, and F. We've all either got the dominant or the recessive for each of those, so it's a, it's a little a or a big A. Little a is a recessive form of that gene. Um, uh, big A is the dominant form of that. Now, if you have all six recessive genes, you're small, the smallest. If you have all six dominant genes, you're tallest. But you can have lots of different combinations of those six genes within it, and they all result in slightly different heights. So this, you know, this individual here has got three 
uh, three dominant genes and, and three recessive genes. These have got four dominant, two uh, recessive. Two dominant, four recessive. You can't pick any of these six genes and say this gene corresponds to height. Or if you know that if this individual has this dominant gene, they will be this height. They won't. It's all these genes are working together. And this is only six genes. You know, you can times that by you know, a few hundred thousand to try and work out something like your intelligence. But we still find in the media people saying the gene 4 has been discovered. The gene for intelligence has been discovered. The gene for autism has been discovered. And it hasn't. It really hasn't. What's been found is a gene that has a particular role that explains like 1% of the variation in the likelihood of someone having autism or not. It is probably a gene for it, but there's still, you know, 100,000 other ones that work with it. So when you, if ever you see this headline, side or boffins or eggheads, love to be called an egghead in the press. Eggheads at the University of Worcester, like, yeah, finally arrived. Um, they say found a gene for X, and if X is a behaviour, no, they haven't. If X is a blood type, yeah, maybe they have. They found a gene that works for it. But we can still talk about genes for behaviours, because we know there is a gene for those traits. They know that there are genes for intelligence. It's kind of a shorthand way of doing it, and it annoys my wife because she, she thinks of genes being for particular things. She knows you know, genes. I say, well, where's the gene for promiscuity? Where is it? And there is no gene thing. Well, I think there is. There's a genetic basis to it. It's going to be a combination of lots of different genes. But when people talk about that, it's very much a shorthand. They haven't found a gene. There is no gene for promiscuity. There's no gene for intelligence. But they all, ha they all work together. Um, we can see those sorts of things. It's, it's easier when it's physical things. If you look at the actions of, say, particular organs like your liver uh, or, or lung functioning, you can see how genes cause issues there. When it comes to behaviour, it's a lot more difficult because you have to try and measure behaviour, which is you know, much more of a, a more complicated thing to do. But because genes create your brain and there are different forms of genes, there should be some way of finding out differences in how your brain functions, in other words, how you behave, how you, how you think, or maybe things like how uh, your brain activity works, that shows the actions of different genes. But it's remarkably difficult to do, as you can imagine. But people have tried to do it. People try to find genes to work out how this could relate to a particular behaviour. I'm going to finish off with an example of what people thought would be something that could actually be, um, have an origin for uh, our particular, um, for one particular psychological trait, which is language. And it's the, the FOXP2 gene. This is it here. I don't know, it could be. It said it was FOXP2 gene. That's what Google Images told me. I'm not going to question them. Um, it's on the locus SBCH1 of chromosome 7. If you're particularly interested in that, any particular chromosome 7 fans, you'd be pleased to know that I have special attention here. Why I'm talking about it here is what we know about its role in language functioning um, and how we actually, how it's been researched. Now, there's one uh, family who have uh, a particular language disorder. They're anonymized here, they're just called KE. And individuals in that family have a particular disorder that relates to their understanding of language and their speech ability. Those members of that family who have that particular disorder have a particular form of the FOXP2 gene that is unique to them. It's a mutation of it. And other members of the family who don't have that mutation are fine. Also, another individual has a very, very similar uh, language disorder to the members of that family. Also, coincidentally, has the same mutated FOXP2 gene. So, from that, thinking, okay, if you have uh, a normal FOXP2 gene, your language works okay. If you have a mutated form, your language doesn't work okay. We'll suggest that, well, FOXP2 gene must have some role in how you lose, use language, how you use speech. So people are like, ah, there we go, we found a gene. We found a gene that has a real role in language. Look, we can see it in this family. And you trace the history of the FOXP2 gene. Um, and we find that the human version of the FOXP2 gene uh, is very different from that of the gene in other species. So uh, lots of genes we share with other species, but this one is really unique to humans, the form we have. And we can see how it varied from other species about 
200,000 years ago, which is probably around the time we really started using speech. So, from this, the fact that the FOXP2 gene, when it works, produces language, and when it doesn't work, it produces uh, disorders of language, and the fact that it's a unique form in humans like languages, and this uniqueness came around about the same time as language did, people said, look, the FOXP2 gene is the gene for language. No. This is why um, it's not. It has a role, but it's not fully it. Firstly, we don't know what FOXP2 gene does in terms of developing your brain. What does it actually do? What does this actually sequence? What series of proteins does this create in your brain? And is it going to be specific to language? Why is it present in other species? If it's something that's, you know, is, language is unique to humans, even though it's a unique form of it, why do other species have it anyway? It must serve some purpose in those other species that don't have language. It only affects part of language development. So not actually anything that's all of language, <coughs> just some aspects of speech. What other effects does it have? Does it produce other changes other than in terms of speech? And also the fact that all we know about it is that if you have a particular mutation of it, it doesn't work very well. Doesn't mean that having it in the correct form means it does work. <coughs> it's like saying, uh, if you take a you know, go back to your, the television, if you undo a screw and take a screw out, and your TV starts just screeching at high pitch for some reason, you won't go, ah, this screw's there to stop the screeching. It probably has some other purpose. But how it's expressed when you take the screw out is it just causes screeching. FOXP2 genes the same way. It probably doesn't just cause people to not have this disorder. It's going to have some more broader effect. So in conclusion, we know that the FOXP2 gene has something to do with language. It has a genetic role in language. But we don't know how, we don't know what specifically, we don't know what's unique in humans, or when and where it occurs, so that's still unclear. And this is really, um, you can take this example and apply it to all areas where we try to understand uh, a psychology from a genetic perspective. We don't really know where it is. We don't really know what role it has. We know it has a role. We definitely know genetics has a role in our psychology. But it's going to be a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting than just saying, here's the gene for language. And as we, our understanding of genetics gets more advanced, we know more about it, we know more about what we don't know, psychology can, ha can use this more. We can take advantage of this. Traditionally, human, yes, well, psychology has been very resistant to, to genetics and biology and evolution in general. We thought about, oh, you know, that's for biology. We're a social science. We don't need to worry about that. I'd say that that's not true. We're a, we are a branch of biology. We need to understand these things, not in as much depth as others do. But from that, I think we get a much richer understanding about lots of different things about our psychology and our behavior and the way we think about things um, from those processes. So uh, I'll leave it there for now. That's a summary of what we've done. If you're particularly interested, um, chapter three of Holt, uh, textbook. More importantly, uh, Evolution Genetics for Psychology. Uh, it's a book by Daniel Lettle. It's a textbook. It's a book about evolution genetics written for psychologists. So it's, it's quite simplistic. It's not written for biologists. It's written for people like you who don't have a biological background. It's very simple, clearly explained. If you'd like to know more, and I would always recommend that you do, I think that'd be very wise. Have a read of that book. It's there in the library worth having a look through.